So as Chris said, I just moved to, uh, uh, to Texas. So I'm with the uh, Olden Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences. This is a, an institute specializing in high-performance computing and also with the uh, Department of Physics. So the work I'm gonna describe now has been done at Oxford, uh, where I was until uh, uh, August. Uh, so before I get started, let me uh, tell you who did the, 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 the work. So the, 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 the main contribution to this talk come from, uh, comes from uh, Wen Hong Xiao. He's sitting at the end of the, uh, this uh, hall and he will pr be presenting a poster uh, uh, in the poster session. So Wen Hong uh, 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 worked on uh, Polarons for his uh, PhD thesis and he defended his thesis just uh, last Friday. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, uh, Carla Verdi, Fabio Caruso, and Samuel Ponce. So Carla and Fabio have been working mostly on the many-body uh, theory of uh, polar on satellites in, in photoemission spectroscopy. And then uh, Samuel has been working mostly on the, uh, helping us with the software implementation. Um, so let me uh, 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 get started uh, uh, by just uh, uh, telling you where we are coming from. Uh, maybe uh, already 10 years ago, even maybe 12 years ago, uh, some of us were interested in understanding how uh, the, the bus structures of uh, semiconductors and insulators change when you uh, uh, incorporate the effect of temperature. And this has led to a lot of uh, studies and calculations, and uh, I would say that uh, in a very, very uh, schematic uh, uh, description, uh, what we understood is that whenever you, you add temperature, maybe the, uh, the, 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 the conduction bands would shift a little bit, uh, and maybe they will broaden uh, due to lifetime effects, uh, and this is something that can be dealt with by using uh, standard uh, many-body perturbation theory techniques. So this was uh, uh, fairly well understood, uh, uh, but then uh, a few years ago, uh, there were some um, photoemission experiments that uh, uh, showed us that there is uh, some extra physics. Uh, so when they tried to look at the conduction bands of some oxides, uh, a few groups noted that uh, there are some extra features uh, below the conduction bands, and these have been called uh, polaron satellites. So this talk is not about polar on satellites, but I want to tell you where we, uh, uh, we started the whole story. So the main experiment describing these things is uh, from uh, Professor Grioni in uh, EPFN in Lausanne. So this is really the first uh, uh, measurement uh, of the satellites, uh, and probably also the cleanest uh, up to this point. Uh, so this is titanium dioxide, and what they did is to uh, photodope the oxide, so uh, by introducing essentially oxygen mechanisms. So this introduces the electrons in the conduction band, and then they image these bands with uh, uh, angle resolved for electron spectroscopy. So these are basically uh, uh, the, really the, the tip of the conduction band bottom. And this is a, a satellite. There's another satellite a bit faded here. And similarly, when you change doping levels. So this was the first experiment showing these kind of features. And these have been called since the uh, uh, polarons or polaron satellites in photoemission. A more recent experiment, uh, just because uh, I'm showing this because we've been involved in this, uh, in this, uh, in this work. Uh, this was performed by the group of uh, Professor uh, um, uh, Filking in St. Andrews, and the idea was to dope um, uh, europium oxide uh, uh, in order to obtain electrons in the conduction band, and this was done by uh, introducing gadolinium in the oxide. And if you zoom into the ARP spectrum, basically you also find a similar feature. You have the conduction band of this object, so this would be this uh, tip here. And then uh, these are one satellite and another satellite, so again we have this kind of features, okay? Uh, so uh, the question is, can we describe these things uh, using uh, ab initial calculations? And uh, the answer is uh, uh, yes, uh, and, but this requires something that goes beyond density functional theory. So in DFT, you don't get this kind of features. So one has to go to uh, uh, a many-body uh, perturbation theory, and uh, to make a very long story short, uh, what one has to do is to uh, work with the, uh, uh, something called the Famiga self-energy and use Dyson's equations, so like uh, one would do in uh, GW calculations. So I'm going very fast here without any details because there will be a talk this afternoon by Carla Verdi, Carla Verdi describing these uh, calculations. Uh, bottom line is that if you implement this kind of uh, self-energies in your calculations and you do the, 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 the calculation themselves, uh, you obtain quite good agreement with experiments. So this is just the plot I showed you in the previous slide. And these are the ab initial calculations. So the broadening is not exactly the same, but you see that there is a conduction by minimum, satellite, satellite. And if you cut the spectrum through the uh, band minimum, you have a quasi-particle peak, first satellite, second satellite, third satellite, and the same in the calculations. So here, the, I, I'm, I'm telling you these things because uh, I want just to make the point that um, now we have a reasonable understanding of these features. Uh, we can calculate them, we can reproduce the experiments. And the, uh, uh, at this point, the question was, uh, what do these features uh, do represent? And uh, one question that uh, was recurrent from uh, experimental colleagues uh, 
was uh, can we use uh, these um, uh, photo emission maps in order to reconstruct the wave function of the polaron? So can we tell something about the spatial localization, the spatial extent, how do they look like? Can we tell something more than a band structure? And we tried to do this, but we ran uh, very quickly into difficulties. That was uh, a little bit challenging. And uh, uh, to uh, really summarize, what I can tell you is that the main challenge is that all the techniques that you use to study uh, Green's functions, they assume that the lattice is periodic. So localization uh, uh, is problematic when you use uh, many, many body techniques like this one. So one has to uh, change approach. And uh, the work we've been doing the past uh, maybe three years is to start from a completely different approach and try to see whether we can achieve localization using uh, standard density functional theory uh, calculations. Uh, so I want to do a very, a very uh, a simple exercise to, to, to guide you through the uh, 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 techniques that uh, I'm going to describe in a second. And uh, I want to use a very simple model. So the, the, the physics that we would like to describe is uh, what happens to an insulator uh, when uh, one adds a, uh, an electron in an uh, otherwise empty conduction band. Uh, so what we have here is a, a periodic uh, crystal field, and then this would be the uh, you know, ions in the system. And um, if you do a calculation with DFT, you add an electron in the conduction band, uh, uh, you, know, you do a calculation on a unit cell, and therefore the uh, electron will, be, will have a periodic uh, uh, charge density. So everything looks identical among different uh, unit cells, and uh, the minimum energy is achieved for the electron sitting at the conduction band bottom. So that's obviously uh, uh, trivial. So now one can do a, 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 a kind of a conceptual experiment and uh, imagine to distort the uh, uh, positions of some of these uh, uh, atoms so, so that uh, they, they form a little bit of a lump in some regional space. So this will modify the average uh, crystal field, and as a result, maybe uh, the electron will find uh, a new configuration, a little bit more localized, okay? So since this is now no longer periodic, it cannot, it cannot belong to these uh, uh, bands uh, because they assume periodicity. So we will find a defect states inside the, the gap. So now what could happen at this point is that if you, if you, could, you could try to relax the, the whole uh, uh, configuration, and uh, two things can happen. The first one is that uh, uh, this is not the most stable. So the system will revert to a fully delocalized solution. Or this is the most stable, or some kind of modification of this one will be stable. And therefore, we say that we have a self-trapped uh, polaron. So this is the physics that we would like to uh, describe using uh, uh, ab initial uh, calculations. So before going to ab initial methods, uh, we thought it would be useful to learn a little bit about the uh, previous literature. And it turns out that this kind of uh, 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 scenario has been described in many, many uh, uh, papers and many textbooks. Uh, so I just want to uh, uh, go through the simplest possible approach because it's very useful and it's very uh, closely connected to dens density functional theory. Uh, so the, the, the simplest approach was really the first, and that was from uh, Pekar uh, in the uh, uh, you know, 1940s. Uh, so that's basically the Pekar model, and the, uh, the equations I'm going to show are summarized by the, uh, uh, in the review by uh, the, uh, Professor De Vries and Alexandrov. So the idea here was to try and describe localization uh, uh, without uh, uh, performing very difficult calculations, uh, so to, by introducing only the minimal ingredients, so the, the, the least uh, uh, ingredients required to have some uh, uh, localized solution. So the first bit is the uh, considering an electron uh, wave function and adding the kinetic energy to the uh, total energy. So this is standard kinetic energy with some kind of effect in mass. And then instead of describing nuclei or ions are uh, discrete objects, so one can uh, uh, describe the system as a continuum dielectric, and therefore the uh, energy uh, associated with that would uh, come with, uh, from the electrostatic uh, uh, energy, okay? So the, the integral of the energy density. Uh, now the question is, uh, how, what do we do with this expression? Well, what, ideally what one would want to calculate this wave function, so this requires connecting the wave function to the electric field and the displacement. So the first relation one can use is that, uh, is the Gauss law. So this is uh, the divergence of the displacement is uh, equal to the density of free carriers. And then one can relate the uh, displacement to the electric field by the dielectric constant. So if you invert these two relations, you get uh, a very standard expression for the electrostatic energy, which is basically a Coulomb integral uh, uh, in the uh, charge density. And here the point is that uh, the screening uh, uh, comes from the total dielectric screening, so the ionic uh, plus the electronic contribution. So this expression is almost correct. There is only one problem. There is some double counting. The double counting comes from the fact that uh, uh, this being the uh, total screening, we are double counting the electronic contribution. And this is because here we are already considering an effective mass, and therefore the electronic screening has already been taken into account. 
so it has been has to be cancelled, and the correct expression basically has a, a subtraction of the electronic uh, uh, directly screening here. So what one can do now is to take this term, plug it back into this equation, and one has an expression that only moves the uh, the wave function of this uh, uh, polar on, let's say. So what one does at this point is to uh, does at this point is to uh, do a variational minimization using a, a constraint that the wave function is normalized. And if you do that, uh, the, the, the operation is quite simple. It gives you an equation that looks a lot like the Schrodinger's equation. Uh, the only difference is that instead of a, a standard potential, you have something a little bit more complicated. Uh, and the result is a nonlinear equation of third order in the wave function, okay? So this is a name, this is called the landau pekar uh, 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 equation. So this is very well known, we are not doing any, any new. Um, now the, the uh, uh, question is, um, uh, what does this solution, does this equation uh, tell us? Well, you can try with very simple trial solutions. And for example, you can try to see whether something localized will uh, solve the problem. So you can try with an exponentially decaying function. And if you do that and you replace inside this expression, the result is extremely simple. The energy becomes the sum of two terms, one which uh, scales as uh, the inverse of the square of the size of the polaron, so this is polaron radius, and there's a plus sign. And the other one scales as the inverse of the size of the polaron, is a minus sign. So this is kinetic energy and this is the Coulomb energy. So since the different scaling at infinity and since they have the opposite number uh, signs, there will be a competition so between this Coulomb and this uh, kinetic part, and the competition leads to the formation of a minimum here, and this is uh, what we call a, a self-trapped uh, polaron, okay? So the reason I'm showing this is that uh, uh, this is really what leads to the development of a technique to study uh, these things from uh, using density functional theory. And before proceeding to DFT, I want to highlight some limitations. So first of all, you can notice that uh, this term, uh, in the case of a non-polar semiconductor or uh, uh, what would happen is that uh, the dielectric constant, uh, uh, including the ionic contribution, will be equal to the electron dielectric constant, and therefore this term will vanish, so there is no self-trapping. Uh, so in non-polar materials, this model doesn't work. In the case of metals, same reasoning, the model doesn't work. And uh, furthermore, the model does not uh, uh, consider any uh, uh, granularity in your uh, uh, crystal. You don't have atoms. You don't have uh, multiple electronic bands. You only have a parabolic band. You don't have multiple phonon branches. So clearly this is not something you can use for predictive um, uh, calculations. So the idea was to try and uh, go beyond these models and uh, using DFT calculations. And the starting point was really the uh, very simple uh, uh, expression for the total energy in density functional theory. And the, 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 the assumption here is that density functional theory contains precisely the same kind of physics, okay? So this is the expression you find in any textbook of DFT, the kinetic part the uh, heart tree energy, exchange correlation, electron ion, and ion-ion interaction. So what we want to do here is to assume that we start from an insulator, so filled valence bands, and we add one electron to the conduction. So the same reasoning can be done by removing one electron from the valence, but let's stick to one electron because it's easier to visualize. So what would happen through this expression is that the kinetic energy would acquire an, an extra term coming from the conduction. In the heart tree, we would have an extra density here, a delta density, and one here and delta density here. And then the other thing that can happen is that uh, the atoms are no longer uh, uh, the same as those at equilibrium, so these uh, displacements may, these uh, atomic positions may change a little bit, okay? And this is exactly what happens when you do a calculation of a supercell adding one electron and looking for localization you know, like a polar in a standard uh, supercell calculation. So this is possible using uh, uh, direct supercell approaches, and I'm sure we're gonna see a lot of these calculations during this uh, workshop, uh, but there are some limitations. So one limitation of a supercell calculation is that you need a very large supercell if you are studying polarons which are not too small, okay? So if your polaron is of the order of a one or two nanometers in size, you need very, very large supercells of, with several thousand atoms. So that's a practical limitation. The second important limitation, maybe the most important, is the fact that calculations are typically very sensitive to the exchange and correlation functional. So this has to do with the self-interaction correction, and I will uh, ex uh, discuss this a little bit more in detail uh, later. But let me tell you what we did here in order to proceed. So basically, we made the f following two assumptions. The first one is that when you add an electron, uh, this electron does not perturb too much the uh, uh, density uh, of uh, valence electrons, okay? The second assumption is that uh, the atoms don't move too far, so you can perform a displace, uh, um, uh, an expansion of these terms to second order in the ionic displacements. And then the third thing we did is to remove the self-interaction of the polaron, so the polaron with itself, okay? 
So if you do th these three steps, it's really uh, some uh, uh, simple maths that you can do, uh, you know, really in a few, uh, in half an hour. So what you discover is that the total energy becomes a very simple expression, and that's essentially a, a, a contribution, which is the expectation value of the constant uh, uh, energy on uh, top of this uh, uh, wave function. Then a linear coupling between the uh, uh, atomic displacements that are called U and the wave function, or the, the, the density of this polaron. And then uh, uh, an elastic penalty energy, which is uh, 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 coming from the Hooke's law. So this is dynamical matrix, so the, the matrix of force constants, and these are the uh, square displacements. So this is uh, uh, just coming straight from this approximation I just mentioned, and I will discuss the validity of this approximation towards the end of the talk. So now we have a, 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 an expression for the energy uh, as a functional of this wave function and the atomic displacements. So when you have that, the first thing you do is to try to find a minimum. So you can do a variational minimization with respect to the wave function and with respect to the displacements, and you want to enforce the normalization of the electronic wave function. So you do that uh, using Lagrange multipliers, as usual, and if you do that, uh, you obtain two equations. The derivative with respect to the wave function gives uh, this first equation, and the derivative with respect to displacements gives the second equation. So the first one, if you look at it, is basically like a standard Kohn-Sham equation, uh, except there is an extra term. So if I set the displacement to zero, I obtain the standard Kohn-Sham equation, so I find a standard band eigenvalue. And the second equation tells me what is the atomic displacement once I found the wave function. So this is a, uh, a coupled, nonlinear system of uh, equations in the wave functions and the, the, the displacements. Now, let me just uh, 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 make a connection with the uh, uh, landau pekar equation described before. So if you try to replace this red bit here, so this term inside the first equation, uh, you obtain this uh, um, expression. So it's a little bit ugly, but you can see that there is a Kohn-Sham uh, uh, Hamiltonian, then some kind of kernel uh, uh, that uh, involves the square of the wave function, then the wave function itself, and then the standard Eigenvalue on the right. And if you compare it with the landau pekar equation, you see that uh, uh, it's almost, uh, at least conceptually, identical. So the, the Kohn-Sham Hamiltonian replaces the kinetic energy. This uh, very complicated kernel replaces the simple Coulomb kernel, and then the rest remains the same. So we are really discussing very similar physics. It's just that here, uh, uh, all these uh, uh, atomic indices and uh, uh, you know, Cartesian directions, everything is taken into account, and the uh, electron phonon coupling comes, uh, uh, can be done essentially from first principles. So this is in principle what we want to solve, but this does not solve the issue of um, uh, having to use very large supercells. So this wave function may be very large, so, uh, uh, so it doesn't help us. So at this point, uh, uh, we uh, made a further step, uh, which actually is pretty obvious, and that's based on the assumption that uh, 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 the uh, Kohn-Sham wave functions, uh, you know, when you calculate them using DFT, they form a complete basis set for the entire space. So that allows you to uh, uh, write the wave function as a linear combination of uh, uh, block waves, okay? So that's uh, something you can always write. That sim simply means that instead of looking for uh, the wave function, uh, we look for the coefficients uh, A, let's say, okay? And the same reasoning can be done for the displacement. So you can always write any displacements uh, in a crystal as a linear combination of vibrational eigenmodes. So here we write this displacement as some uh, uh, linear combination of these eigenmodes times some uh, coefficients that we call V. So at this point, you take these two expressions, you plug them into the equations I gave you before, and after a, a little bit of algebra, you obtain these two equations, and this is essentially the main result of the work that I wanted to present. So these are, again, uh, two coupled nonlinear equations. Uh, uh, we would like to find the coefficients A and B for the electrons and for the uh, displacements. And the reason why we like this expression is that if you look at the ingredients, these are something that we can calculate pretty easily these days. So the first ingredient is the electronic band structure, okay, epsilon and k. The second one is the phonon dispersions, omega q nu. And the third one is the electron phonon matrix elements. So, all, so this can be obtained from DFT. Phonons and electron phonon matrix elements can be obtained from density functional perturbation theory. So we have all the ingredients to do this calculation. And at this point, the complexity is to try and, and, and diagonalize the system and to see what are the solutions. So one uh, technical aspect I want to mention is that you can see here we have a summation over wave vectors. So this is not a coincidence, it's not an approximation. So whenever you uh, uh, write this uh, as a discrete summation, what this means is that we are describing a polaron in a, a periodic supercell, okay? Uh, 
So for example, if you use a grid of uh, four by four by four K points, that means that we are studying a polaron in a periodic supercell which has a size of four by four by four unit cells, okay? So it's not a single polaron in the middle of nowhere, but it's a, an array of polarons uh, kind of periodically repeated. So when you do that, then you need to check whether this thing has uh, any solutions. And uh, here Wen Hong did uh, a lot of calculations to find out uh, what happens in some simple cases. So this is uh, for lithium fluoride. This is basically the um, uh, archetype uh, uh, polaronic uh, uh, ionic uh, insulator. So we took this as an example. And what uh, this plot shows is basically the uh, uh, formation energy of the polaron, so the energy of the localized solution minus the energy of the corresponding uh, consham, let's say, fully delocalized solution. And if you do a calculation with a supercell, which is, let's say, in size seven by seven by seven, you don't find any localized solution. So the delocalized state is the most stable. If you go to 888, the same, 999, 10, 10, 10, 11, 11, and then at some point, when you hit 12, 12, 12, you find a solution, which actually is still not uh, uh, more stable, but uh, yeah, some kind of wave function here, which is localized. And then when you go to 13, 13, 13, it starts to become uh, a little bit more energetic, uh, 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 energetically favorable to localize, okay? So what this uh, transition means, and this is precisely uh, what uh, uh, in standard textbook one would call the uh, mod uh, metal to insulator transition. And there is, the, the way to understand is the following. So if you have a polaron in, in an array, so in a, in a uh, periodic uh, supercell, what is happening is that uh, uh, this polaron uh, will have some uh, neighbors, uh, some replicas, okay? So if the size of the supercell is comparable to the size of the polaron, well, each polaron will overlap with its neighbors, and at some point you start forming bonding and anti-bonding orbitals, and this basically will create a delocalized solution. So if you have too many polarons crowded together, you will actually have a, 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 a delocalized solution being more stable, actually. And then when the polarons start getting a bit further apart from each other, they can localize and they can become more stable than the uh, standard Consham uh, 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 solutions. So this is really the point where you have this transition, and if you try to evaluate this boundary using the standard uh, MOT criterion, you get an, an, a value which is pretty much in this range. So actually that uh, coincides with the uh, actual physics. Now, if you try to increase the size of the supercell, what is happening uh, physically is that uh, you're looking at a bigger supercell, but the size of the polaron remains unchanged. So you're really uh, 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 diluting the number of polarons, so the density of polarons in your system. And what is happening is that the energy of the polaron is changing. And the reason why this happens is the same as uh, 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 what you find in calculations of defects. Whenever you have a charge defect, uh, the energy depends on the size of the supercell. This is simply a, a, a Madelung energy, so an electrostatic interaction between charges. So if you want to find the energy of a polar in the middle of nowhere, uh, you need to extrapolate for an infinite size supercell. And this correctly goes as a one over the size of the uh, supercell. And uh, in this case, the extrapolation gives, uh, uh, let's say, 230 millivolt, which is the formation energy in the case of the electron in uh, lithium fluoride, okay? So that's uh, the kind of calculations one can do. This is about energetics, and then at some point one can ask uh, how this, uh, does this polaron look, uh, and this is the uh, uh, calculation that uh, Wen Gong performed. So this is basically the wave function of the polaron. I should say this is a quite a, a fancy rendering, so he spent quite a lot of time to, to, to obtain this uh, kind of a resolution. And uh, you can see it's a, a, a spherical object. This reflects the cubic symmetry of the uh, lithium fluoride lattice. But uh, you can see some uh, atomistic detail, which comes from the fact that this is a combination of uh, lithium uh, S type wave functions, okay? So that's basically uh, how uh, uh, you know, a photograph of a polar may look like in a calculation. Now, uh, the next question is, uh, 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 this is about the wave function of the electrons, but what about the atoms? So this again the, is the electrons, just for comparison. So for the atoms, you can look at the displacements, and this is a representation in terms of arrows, and these are only the fluorine. So fluorine are negatively charged, so the born affected charge is negative, and therefore they will be repelled by the electronic charge, which is also negative, and therefore they, they point outwards here. So if you do the same plot for lithium, they will point inward, okay? So that's the displacement pattern, and it's slightly more spread than the electronic charge, and this has to do with the fact that the, uh, the, the, the matrix of force constants are uh, long-ranged in this case, okay? So the solution is a bit wider than the electronic solution. And here, just to uh, give you a, a, an idea of the size of the supercell that would be needed to obtain this polaron in a, a standard DFT calculation, we're talking about uh, 3,500 3, uh, 3, atoms, so it's pretty large supercell to obtain this thing. And here, let's say the, the, the problem, you can see that uh, when you start studying polarons and you don't know the size of the polaron a priori, uh, there is a little bit of an issue because if you try to uh, 
find the polaron and uh, your calculation does not give you one, it doesn't mean that there is not one. It just means maybe that your supercell is not big enough. So it's very challenging to decide uh, 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 you know, by direct calculations whether there will be a polarons or not. So that's for uh, the electron. Let me uh, uh, now tell you a little bit of what we can uh, do by uh, uh, using this technique. Uh, we calculated this wave function, but the wave function was really obtained as a linear combination of block waves. So maybe the coefficients are not just something that we use as a tool for a solution, but it's something that we can use to analyze the structure of the polar. So what we do here is uh, something that is very common in the study of the bezier peter equation for ac accidents. So there people try to uh, uh, plot the coefficients on the bus structure to see what forms uh, the accident. So we are doing the same but for the polar. So here the circle uh, uh, represents the magnitude of these coefficients plotted on the bus structure. So if there is no circle, it means that those don't contribute. And what you can see here is that uh, the band minimum uh, uh, contributes mostly, predominantly, to this polar. So you might also say that after this calculation that maybe if you do an effective mass model of lithium fluoride, that should work, actually. But that's really something we can tell a posteriori. Now, in the case of phonons, uh, something more interesting happens. So this is the phonon dispersion, so lithium fluoride. You can see that the uh, most important contribution comes from the longitudinal optical phonon near gamma. So these are long wavelength longitudinal optical phonons. So this is really something that uh, you can consider as a, a hallmark of the uh, uh, Frölich interaction. So in fact, by combining the fact that we are looking at a parabolic uh, 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 mass here, parabolic band, and uh, long wavelength longitudinal optical phonons, we may say that this object behaves as a Frölich polaron. But we're not saying that as an assumption. We are saying that because the calculation tells us this. Uh, even if you uh, make this kind of assumption, you realize actually that this plot contains more information. So if you look uh, below here, uh, also the acoustic modes are contributing. So if you go and look inside, these are uh, piezoacoustic modes that exist because these are uh, polar material. And if you uh, do an analysis in terms of density of states, uh, you discover that they contribute approximately 30% to the total energy formation energy of the polar. So this is to say that even in a model as simple as lithium fluoride, which is probably the simplest possible system you can study polar in, uh, assuming that it's just a Frolish problem uh, uh, is not entirely correct because there is extra physics that doesn't come out from this uh, kind of uh, simplified uh, uh, perspective. So this actually is uh, to show you know, what you can get out of these uh, 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 calculations. Now, to, to look at an extremely uh, 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 kind of different scenario, I just want to now consider the case of a hole uh, in lithium fluoride. So here we've been adding an electron in the conduction. What we could do is to also remove an electron from the valence, okay? So in this case, the, the, the polaron looks like this. So it's localized uh, uh, within a couple of unit cells. So we are in the opposite regime. These are actually a, a, a very small polaron. And uh, uh, if you look at this uh, and they try to study also, in this case, the, the metal in pseudo transition, you realize that actually, as soon as you have a couple of unit cells, you can fit already a polaron. So this means, uh, from the point of view of physics, is that uh, 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 you can actually extract a lot of electrons from this object before you start forming a, a, a metallic delocalized state, okay? So in this case, uh, studying the band structure of the valence uh, using uh, delocalized solutions may not be actually uh, 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 adequate anymore because as soon as you start removing holes, they all like to uh, localize. So that's uh, one piece of information, and now we can analyze how they are made of. So this is the distribution of the coefficients. In this case, they belong to the valence, but it's not just the top of the valence, it's the entire band, okay? So that's very different from the electron polaron. And if you look at phonons, now you have the longitudinal optical band is still the most important, but the, the weights are distributed throughout the, the brilliant zone, and also the uh, transverse optical modes contribute a little bit, and also the piezoacoustic modes also contribute. So in this case, what one may say is that this is not a uh, Frolich polaron. I mean, it doesn't uh, satisfy the typical Frolich criteria, but it's very similar to what people would call a hosting polaron, okay? And again, it's not something we assume a priori, but it's something that we tell uh, starting from by looking at this uh, 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 type of analysis. Now, this is uh, uh, what um, uh, we can say about uh, this um, uh, kind of uh, systems. Uh, now I want to tell you a little bit of uh, uh, details about uh, uh, the problems and the challenges in these calculations. So first of all, I told you that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, we are making assumptions. One assumption is that you add or remove an electron, and that does not alter the underlying uh, density, okay? So this is quite a strong assumption. The only way to verify whether it's okay or not is to compare a direct calculation with these kind of systems. So we did that for a, a, a lithium oxide. So this is a standard oxide uh, found in uh, battery materials. And uh, 
in the case of DFT calculations, you have a, a delocalized object, so which is basically a, a, a planar uh, uh, wave function. So what we are, I'm comparing here now is the calculation coming from this um, uh, perturbative approach, the one I just described. And this instead is a direct calculation using density function theory, but with self-interaction correction. I will describe in the next slide how we do self-interaction correction. So you can see that the total energies are very similar. So this is 442 electron volts, and this is 457, so they differ by uh, less than 3%, okay? And I need to remind you that the assumption here is that the valence charge density does not change. The atoms only are displaced up to the second order, so it's basically a second order um, uh, uh, approach. And uh, uh, you know, uh, still, uh, with these approximations, the, the, the thing seems to work pretty well. You also notice that this is a little bit more asymmetric than what we find. So I believe that this is actually a problem of our implementation of self-interaction correction. In fact, if we go looking at the uh, former uh, studies of this uh, system, this is with hybrid functionals, the polar is very nicely symmetric, uh, uh, like we find in our uh, uh, calculations, okay? So this is a way to tell you that even in the extreme case where the polar is extremely localized, you, this approximation that the valence density is not changing much is very uh, uh, appropriate because it doesn't uh, uh, mess up our calculations. Then uh, I, I promised to say something about self-interaction. So this is a very important problem in the, in the, in the study of polarons. Uh, uh, the issue is that if you add an electron into a delocalized Consham state, the state is very delocalized. So the self-interaction is actually not that important. But when electrons get localized, uh, this can actually change the energetic quite dramatically, and that's the case for polarons. So really one has to remove the self-interaction, and the way we have done it is to uh, essentially take the uh, standard DFT functional, uh, this was PB, but it can be done with any functional, and basically uh, uh, to remove the Hart uh, uh, self-interaction of the polaron, and then to remove the exchange and correlation uh, self-interaction to second order, okay? So the way this is done is to essentially use a, 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 a finite difference expression uh, for the uh, second derivative of the exchange and correlation energy. So this was proposed, uh, something similar was proposed by the group of Maori a few years ago to study uh, uh, polarons in, in, in alpha quartz. We made some modifications that uh, are designed in such a way that uh, your band structure is not affected by this um, uh, uh, self-interaction correction. So this is basically what we have done. And uh, 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 now I just want to tell you uh, uh, why it is important to incorporate self-interaction and uh, why this is actually a major issue in the study of polarons. And I want to do that using, uh, uh, again, the Peckard model, which is uh, uh, something I introduced at the beginning. So this is uh, 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 the, the standard expression for the uh, Peckard model, what I described in the second slide, okay? And now I want to uh, uh, try to see what happens if uh, I were to do the calculation using the FT. So I add self-interaction uh, into the Peckard model, okay? It's uh, essentially, I, I abuse the Peckard model and I add the self-interaction, so it's just the interaction of the polar with itself. So if you redo the same maths that I showed you at the beginning, what happens is that the equations are almost identical to uh, what we had, but there is an extra term, okay? Now, this extra term, if you look at it, is exactly uh, the same shape as this one, okay? So the only difference between this and this is that here there is this factor, and this is a, a prefactor of minus one compared to that. Now, what happens? This number is real, positive, and smaller than one. This is real, positive, and smaller than one. So their difference is real, positive, and also smaller than one. When you subtract minus one from this one, this number turns negative. Since there's a minus sign, this becomes positive. So in the Peckard model, when you add self-interaction, you can never have localization, okay? So this actually is very important because it means that uh, in the NC functional theory, if you were to do apply to this very simple model, you would never see a polar. Now, what is the implication? When you use things like DFT plus U or uh, hybrid functionals, one is partially canceling the self-interaction, and therefore one is modifying this, uh, the prefactor of this coefficient. So one can achieve localization. However, the price is that the localization will be dependent on the exchange uh, fraction that you incorporate or on the U parameter, okay? And this is precise because of this problem. So our uh, kind of uh, uh, suggestion is to actually try to remove entirely the, the heart self-interaction as opposed to uh, use uh, uh, functionals to cure for uh, uh, this effect. And now, uh, maybe for the experts in uh, kind of the uh, kind of polaron in uh, kind of in uh, former uh, theories based on models, I just want to uh, uh, explain where we are. So this is a plot that uh, uh, is very famous. I mean, uh, uh, for the Frolich model, uh, is uh, is the essentially the total energy as a function of the coupling strength, uh, and this is uh, been obtained by Feynman. It's the same that you obtain. I mean, very similar to what you obtained by the diagrammatic Monte Carlo. And uh, uh, I just want to show you where we are with lithium fluoride. So the hole was not Frolich. The lithium oxide was not Frolich but the electron lithium fluoride is a Frolich polar, we can say. So this is the 
uh, what we have calculated. So this is the alpha is approximately five, and this number comes from the DFT, so from the uh, linear response calculation. So you can see that we are not on top of this uh, solution here, okay? But we are closer to the PICAR model. So this reinforces the notion that when you do a DFT calculation, you are really looking at PICAR physics and not at the full physics of polarons. And what this means in practice is that we are performing, as obviously, an adiabatic calculation, because DFT is an adiabatic theory, and therefore we obtain the solution for adiabatic polarons, which is the uh, PECAR theory. So the reason why they are not exactly identical is that we also have contribution from piezoacoustic modes, which increase a little bit the formation energy. But this is basically to say that uh, we are still far from a complete theory of polarons. So this is simply a better way to do DFT calculations of polarons, uh, but we are still not at the point of doing full many-body calculations with uh, 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 the accuracy, let's say, of diagrammatic Monte Carlo, obviously. So there is a lot of, of uh, uh, stuff to do yet. And uh, this is the, the summary. I just want to say that uh, I started very briefly introducing why we studied polarons. Uh, uh, the reason was that ARPES uh, found many new interesting features. And then the question became, how do we visualize these polarons and what we can tell about those? And I should tell you that now the connection between the left and the right is still missing. It's something actually quite complicated. We are trying to look at it, but uh, uh, the, the maths are, are quite challenging. So maybe in a couple of years, we will be able to say something also about how to connect a DFT theory with a more many-body uh, approach. But for now, uh, this is it. And just as advertisement, the calculations were done with the EPW code, which is also part of the Quantum Espresso package. So this is it, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a very impressive talk, and I'm sure there are questions. Okay, let's start, Shark. Well, 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 I mean, well, yeah, this is basically, uh, so this is the uh, Frelich Alpha, okay? So the blue is just the Feynman's calculation uh, uh, taken directly from the book. I mean, just uh, the limits are low and high alpha. Then uh, uh, the red is the Pecker solution. And this dot is uh, the calculation in the following way. We took alpha by simply looking at the dielectric constants, okay? And then the energy is, uh, the value I gave before is 230 millivolt divided 77 millivolt, which is the uh, characteristic energy of lithium fluoride. So this is uh, 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 an estimate of what DFT is saying for. This is the alpha that was characterized as coupling with the LO for. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that's why. What, that's yeah. That's exactly what I would. But maybe you are hinting at the fact that the dot could be shifted to the right potentially, which or to the left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or that this alpha only represents one. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So this is clearly. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, we are, we, are, we are taking a model with atoms and branches and bands, and we are just getting a number. This is just too, uh, qualitative. I think the point I want to make is that. Uh, we are really uh, reproducing somewhat the red line, and we're still a long way to go uh, 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 before we reach the blue line uh, with our initial calculations. That's basically the, the point. But that depends on your assumption about alpha, right? If no, but I mean, I guess, uh, I guess this is really, uh, uh, well, the alpha is only defined within the Froch model, obviously. Right. So, yeah. uh, but I mean, I guess my point is that, you know, we still have a, a diabetic theory, which is not uh, the full story, uh, and that, that's the only point, I guess. Uh, um, so one of the improvements of going to the Feynman model there was that you had a basically sort of time dependent principle theory. So if in the Feynman model you just put in the, the band dial or the CANSAT for the wave function, you can get the same energy out. And it seems you might actually be able to do that basically because you have the normal modes for the vibration and you can just solve that by having this thing. So I think the, uh, um, the, what is missing is, I mean, uh, that's a long, well, it's a difficult uh, question. The, the, what is missing is that in, okay, the DFT solution has classical nuclei, so you have arrows that display, you know, they're just point particles, so there is no quantum uh, uh, zero-point motion, for example, but also it's a, a, a product solution, so it's the electron times the, the nuclei, while in the Feynman model they are uh, correlated. So essentially we are missing the electron-ion correlation, uh, uh, so it's not just a matter of uh, uh, making an improvement of what we have. I think it, we are missing quite some bits. For sure, but the, the correlation is done over explicit integration over time, so it's going to basically be the, the, the polar interacting with the, 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 the issue that's starting to be translated. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, basically you're saying you know, one could try to use these things to, to achieve that solution. Yeah, that, that would be fantastic. I mean, actually, we're trying to look at that, but already generalization of the Feynman model to more than one phonon branches seems to be a disaster. Uh, so, yeah, but that's certainly one, something that one should do, actually. Here, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, uh, what? It's something wrong to, I did trace a pattern. I, 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 I don't say that it's wrong, but it's a pattern. So, I mean, in the, in the, in the, so if this is the total energy of the system, and I just want to add self-interaction, okay? So, l let's forget how I obtained this part. Mm -hmm. I just want to add self-interaction. Uh -huh. The self-interaction is just the electron with itself, okay? Yes, yes. So, that's it. So, then, then the fact that there is a, the self-interaction may be screening all these things, it has to come from the ionic screening, but it's through this term. Ah, yeah, of course. Uh, for your density function, I think it is a reasonable, yeah. But for Pekka, when we forget density function and start uh, just for Pekka model, yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Already, uh, completely for, for yeah, yeah. about Pekka. I, I totally see what you're saying. I mean, I think uh, the, the only thing I can say as an answer is that, so. What, I mean, suppose that you can write this as a sum of something plus the self-interaction, okay? Okay, so what we're doing here, what I was doing there is to re represent the something mm -hmm. as Pekar, mm -hmm. and the self-interaction remains outside. So that's basically the way to, to, to describe what DFT would do. You know, it's... But also it would not change your argument. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we haven't done anything like that. So we, we can study the effects of uh, variations of the charge density to phonons, but that is done mostly by using self-energy techniques. So here, essentially the phonons don't know, at least in, in this kind of analysis, the phonons don't know that how many electrons have been added or what is the density of polarons, let's say. So the dynamical matrix remains exactly the same as in the ground state. I mean, this is an approximation. I mean, it could be improved, but we haven't done it. Okay. Yeah, this is basically like standard DFT. So, so where, where, where? I mean, so the Frolich model, I mean, uh, so in the Pekar model, the, the, there are no ions. So you mean the, the last slide or? So, the, yeah, yeah, this will introduce uh, uh, some correction, but it's not enough to... Correct. Yeah, yeah. In the Feynman model? Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. That, that's, yeah, we, we don't have that. That's, that's clear, I mean, but that's... Do you uh, but that's basically what we are trying to do by removing the uh, self-interaction, basically. So by doing that, uh, 
Oh, I totally agree, but this is a, a special case because it's one electron added to the conduction. So actually, it's a very so it's not the same as self-interaction for all the states. It's for one state. So basically, if you do that, okay, so what this does is that, so look at it as the uh, second derivative of the exchange correlation, so it's first derivative of the, of, the, of the potential, okay? So what this does is to keep the, essentially this keeps the exchange and correlation interaction between the polaron and the valence electrons, but it removes the exchange and correlation interaction of the polaron with itself, okay? Two second order, so the third order is still there. I mean, we cannot do anything about that. I mean, we can look at the maths, but basically, so, so this is non linear, right? So we cannot do it simply by just removing a bit. So this is basically uh, trying to remove second derivative of exchange correlation with respect to density square times. Which one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so basically, it's uh, if you. So if you don't do. Let me maybe go, go to this one. So if you don't do that you get extra terms here, which are the, 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 the exchange of the polar with itself. That's, that's the problem. Okay. No, I'm just saying that if you don't uh, do that correction, so if you don't remove that, yeah. there is a, an exchange of correlation of the polar with itself appearing here, essentially, which is not something that you would want. Yeah, regarding this expression of the No, so this, yeah, basically this is basically, I mean, in this formalism, you don't need to worry because essentially it's all linear response. But if you do a direct calculation, you need to essentially decide that, uh, uh, I don't know, all the uh, valence is, uh, you know, for each spin up, there is a spin down and your polarine is a spin up, for example. So you need to, to constrain the, the, okay, the spin. So the, the yes, spin yeah, 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 for the direct calculation, yeah. All right. Okay, Stefan. So I think we have a good understanding of the magnitude of the self-interaction effect for localized states. Uh, we haven't done it, but uh, essentially from the knowledge of the uh, dissolution, in principle it could be done, and I guess it could be expressed in terms of uh, uh, this kind of expansion. So it could, I guess, we are saying that one could take the solution and from that evaluate the, yeah, it, could, it would be very nice actually if we haven't done it. Yeah, correct. So, where is this uh, spring in the polarum uh, by itself? So, so, sorry, can you repeat? Because, uh, so, where, where is the spring in the polarum by itself that you would want to remove? And why is it there? Here? Yeah, in your DKS. So, I'm, I'm getting lost. So, here, basically, the self interaction has been removed from this formalism, essentially. Okay, so this one has been designed starting from from these expressions, okay? So when you do that operation on this expression, which has self-interaction removed, you obtain that, okay? Okay, <laughs> short questions, because we should be moving on, Alex. So the underlying function would be D, but when you remove self-interaction from the electron, then actually the Wenger is still much more than D. So where is the electron? Oh, the, the, basically, it the, uh, depends on which system. I mean, it's... Uh, For example, Yeah, yeah, it's basically they are inside the bang up. I mean, if you look at the Ege Marius. No, it isn't. It cannot be the bang up, because bang up is uh, six volts. No, no, in lithium fluoride, the bang up in the system is about nine volts in the FT. And the, 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 this uh, Ege Marius, I don't know, what was that? Is, uh, the metal value of bang up is 13.6. Yeah, it's about 14, yeah, correct. Yeah, so when the polarum is very shallow... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so basically the, the, all these energies, so this is the formation energy, I didn't mention this is the Ege value, 
okay, or the polaron, so the cone sham, let's say, eigenvalue. So this uh, uh, ends up being, let's say, minus 0.8 electromoles. So this has to be, uh, this is really, uh, referred to the bottom of the conduction band, which in the calculation is, let's say, nine electromoles. So this will be sitting at 8.1 electromoles, about uh, 8.2 electromoles, about the valence, essentially. Uh, so the, the reference is always the conduction band. I mean, that's because the, the, the expansion is done in terms of conduction states. Okay, last question. Yeah, so that's basically the, the uh, I guess the answer is this picture. I mean, so we, uh, these are direct calculation or this one, and this is the second order expansion. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, the point is that uh, um, ions move into second order, I mean, it doesn't mean that they cannot move much. It just means that you consider, you know, the, the parabolic expansion. I mean, you make an error, but that error may be very small. Yeah, that's the...